Okay, in chapter four, we're going to begin the, the journey of looking at the infant and the toddler. And you'll notice that what um, your author does, Laura Burke, what she does is kind of looks at physical, cognitive, social, emotional um, development. So we're going to start off looking at the physical development and infancy and toddlerhood. So let's go ahead and get started. So the very first year, I mean, we just got finished looking at prenatal development, and I'm, I'm assuming you're going to be just kind of in awe of how much happens over that nine-month period of time. Well, physical growth really continues to happen in a very, very significant way over the course of the first year. In fact, you can see there's a 50% um, increase in growth. Um, in terms of length and in terms of birth weight, they triple in size. So um, babies are doing quite a lot during that very first year. If we take a look at brain development, it's pretty cool to see how much is happening in terms of their brain development. So a couple of things I want to bring your attention to. First of all, the um, stimulation is really important. You, you can read a little bit about what happens to a baby who is not um, exposed to any stimulation, but we don't want to over um, you know, stimulate our babies either. So too much isn't necessarily good, but we do ne need to have opportunities for that neural development. So we want to present them with opportunities for learning. There are a couple of times that the glial cells um, end up becoming pretty significant. And this is during pregnancy through age two. And then later on, again, we'll talk about this when we get to the adolescent years. And the key here with these glial cells is that they are responsible for myelination. Myelination, if you recall from your intro to psych days and how neural communication works, is if you just kind of think about all the neural pathways that are in the brain, you see all of these, the insulation kind of wraps itself around there, which allows the messages to happen in a much more efficient manner. So these glial cells really do play a very important role because we need to establish very efficient neural pathways. Pretty, pretty cool stuff. So there are two different kinds of, um, you know, experiences that we're going to look at. The experience-dependent neural connections and the other is experience-expectant. Experience-dependent is that the um, synapses the synapse connections are created because of your experiences. So something happens, and as a result of that experience, your brain reacts and creates a um, neural pathway for you. Now, that happens, you know, all the time when we're engaged in learning, for sure. We're kind of creating new pathways. Hopefully that's happening even to you right now. Um, but experience expectant is when these connections were actually created for experiences. So in essence, what happens is that the brain is expecting certain things to happen. Where they're expecting you to learn to walk, or, you know, around age one to two. They're expecting, you know, you to begin talking in, in more, much more significant ways around age three or so. So they kind of do the red carpet treatment in your brain and they kind of have these pathways all paved out for you and ready to go. Whereas with the experience dependent that we talked about first, there's no red carpet treatment, but they're certainly ready to go ahead and roll it out when you're ready. So it's not waiting for you, but it's going to respond to what you're doing. So we certainly have tons and tons of neurons, as you can see here, and lots and lots of synapses. The key is, is we need to develop good neural pathways um, and really establish those. And we do that through learning. And a lot of that happens naturally without a significant amount of effort. And in some cases, it might require a little bit more effort. Um, one of the areas I wanted to point your attention to was the area of breastfeeding. Um, I know there's a lot of different literature out there on breastfeeding, and I wanted to share this one study with you. I know it's a little bit dated, but it's a pretty powerful study because it was looking at the developmental impact of breastfeeding on child development at five years old. So it was a longitudinal study. So remember from our um, first chapter, a longitudinal study tracks the same children um, all across time. So it's pretty cool to have one of those kinds of studies because, as I said before, for most researchers are not that patient in waiting that long for um, you know the results of their study. So what these researchers hypothesized is they thought that breastfeeding would have a positive impact and the impact or dependent variable that they were interested in was cognitive functioning. And they thought that this would go above and beyond anything that had to do with family and social variables so that there would be kind of an independent benefit of breastfeeding. So if you look at the study, you'll certainly see how large in scale it is, which speaks also to the power of the study. We had over 7,000 infants at birth, and then they had almost 4,000 at five years, which is a significant amount. So, um, you know, clearly many parents may no longer be interested in doing the study, but they might move away, all different kinds of things happen. So this is a pretty good turnout for the study. 
So here's how they did the study. They looked at breastfeeding and they obviously couldn't do an experimental study because that wouldn't have um, been very ethical to require some parents to breastfeed and others not. That wouldn't work so well. So instead they're doing what's called a quasi-experimental study, which means it kind of looks like an experiment, but it doesn't have the randomization. So we know that's a pretty critical point, but you'll see what um, they did to kind of compensate for it. It doesn't fix the problem, but it certainly does help a little bit. So here's what they did is they categorized folks into either not breastfeeding at all, doing it for less than three weeks, three to seven, seven weeks to four months, four to six months, or six months or more. Okay, this was the independent variable. The dependent variable is the cognitive functioning, and they looked at receptive language. So that's uh, how well are they able to understand language. Now you'll notice here there's a list of confounding variables. So what they did, because they knew they couldn't control for, the, for these via random assignment, is they assessed all of the kinds of variables that they thought might have an impact on receptive language. So they looked at things such as birth weight, an APGAR score, some physical conditions, um, whether or not they were in daycare, where they looked at stimulation, because they know that has a big impact on neural pathways and development, maternal education, depression, anxiety, the list goes on. I just grabbed a few here so you could have an idea of the extent of it. So by doing that, they're able to actually statistically kind of remove the effects of all the confounding variables. So then you're looking at the effects of breastfeeding on cognitive functioning. Still, we're not going to be able to talk in terms of causation, but we are going to be able to feel a lot more confident in the results um, than if they didn't assess for all these other variables. So here's what they found. They found that the infants who were breastfed for at least six months had significantly higher cognitive scores on the PPVT, which is an assessment inventory, the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test, and it basically assesses their um, receptive language, how well do they understand. And this was true even after they statistically controlled for all those confounding variables. Now, what we look at here are the differences in IQ testing. So if you know anything about IQ tests, the average is 100. In fact, the average range is 90 to 109. So we're not saying that the, folks, the babies who were not breastfed were, you know, in the, the low average or, you know, anything like that. They still were in the average range. But this is a pretty significant finding. So although both um, groups were in the average range, we can see this was a, almost a 10-point difference. And an IQ score, that's pretty significant. And it certainly was statistically significant. So pretty powerful stuff that, you know, we, we want to really emphasize um, to parents that they want to breastfeed for at least six months. Okay. Now, one of the other um, topics in this chapter has to do um, with how do babies learn. So I'm just going to give you a quick refresher. My hope is that you recall some good old favorites from Intro to Psych, like Pavlov and Classical Conditioning. So if you remember his famous experiment with the dog and the salivation, we're going to look at what happened before the dog was conditioned. So in the beginning, the dog was presented with meat powder. And when that happens, a dog is going to automatically salivate. You don't need to train the dog to do that. It happens automatically. And that is going to be an unconditioned stimulus and an unconditioned response. Because basically the word conditioned means learned. So un means not. It was a not learned stimulus with a not learned response. Okay, um, then the bell is something that is called a neutral stimulus. And the reason it's neutral is because nothing happens. So if the dog hears a bell, unless it learns something, it will not do anything in response to that bell. Now, conditioning takes place. So what happened was, if you recall from that study, is every time before the meat powder was presented, a bell rang. So it was bell, meat powder, bell, meat powder, bell, meat powder. So the dog started to connect those two stimuli after numerous pairings. And now the bell became a conditioned stimulus, which then produced the salivation, which was a conditioned response. Again, conditioned means learned. So before this bell was a neutral stimulus, but now it is a conditioned one because it learned it's associated with the meat powder. So when you think about babies and um, some examples that might happen with them, if you take the baby's bib out, that may get them really excited because they've learned that bib means it's time to eat. It's time for, you know, meal time. So they get really excited about that. Um, you know, so you can see conditioning certainly happening in infants. Now, stimulus generalization is when it begins with one a stimulus, but then it starts to transfer onto other areas. So Little Albert's the kind of classic example of this, and what we learned from Little Albert's experiment, unfortunately, it's kind of traumatic and unethical certainly, was that the um, loud noise represented by the hammer right here, 
um, was paired with the rat, a white rat. So basically, the um, little baby learned to get afraid of a white rat because initially this was a neutral stimulus. It didn't do anything, didn't have any baby reaction. But once you had the loud noise paired with it, the baby would then be startled by the rat. But they soon discovered that it wasn't just the rat that created this crying. It was then became anything white and furry. So it really did extend to other white furry animals and things of that nature. So that can happen um, with babies as well. So it may be that maybe you didn't actually get the, you weren't putting the bib on, but maybe you're putting a new shirt on the baby. And as you go to do that, they think it's the bib and they start to get excited because they're going, they think they're going to get to eat. So the other type of learning, so classical conditioning is learning by association. That's the one we just reviewed with, um, you know, all of the different stimuli and conditions and conditioned stimuli and responses. The other type of learning is called operant conditioning, and that is B.F. Skinner's um, theory. And basically what he focused on was that we learn by consequences. So um, you might recall from intro, your intro days, the Skinner box, where the rat um, inside the Skinner box, if they press this little lever here, they got a food pellet, they're going to increase the chances of pressing that, that little lever. If you press that and you get an electric shock, it's not going to do it so much. So basically, if you get a good consequence, you keep doing it. A bad consequence, you don't. So that's pretty much what the um, operant conditioning is all about. It's about the consequences. I'll give you a second to read that. Okay, so the assumption with this theory is um, that we are not really in control, but whoever's in control of our consequences kind of in controls our behaviors. So now when we look at behavioral theories, we have a couple of different ways to, it, to impact um, a person. One way is through reinforcement. Positive reinforcement is going to be good consequences for a good behavior. So when we give a smile, gold stars, you know, if you get a good grade, it's going to increase the likelihood of you engaging in those actions again. Negative reinforcement also is about increasing the behavior, but instead of giving them a good consequence, we're taking away something bad. Now, the key here is that you are taking something bad away. If you're taking something good away, then we're going to go down into the punishment area. So the goal here is that we're trying to increase the behavior. Um, so a, an educational example would be the homework pass. If you do your homework Monday to Thursday, you won't have any homework on the weekend. Um, another example, a great example is really when you sit down in the car and it goes beep, beep, beep until you put your seatbelt on. Once you put that on, the annoying noise goes away. They're trying to increase your usage of seatbelts. The, the punishment approach is obviously different. What we're trying to do here is to decrease the behavior. And we can do that by yelling, you know, screaming, a spanking, which is certainly not recommended. But those kinds of actions will decrease the behavior. So the next way of learning is observational learning. That's the third um, type of learning. And here, what B Bandura basically said is Skinner's on to something, but it's not just about whether or not you experience the consequence. You can actually also learn by experience, uh, experiencing um, someone else watching, uh, experiencing the consequence at rather. So by watching someone else get a good or bad consequence, you too can learn. And you might recall the famous Bobo doll study where it was looking at aggression and whether or not um, little children were going to act aggressively oops, went too far, um, after watching a model. So on this top row here, you can see this is about the grown-up hitting on the Bobo doll. The children who were watching this then also became very aggressive to the Bobo doll. So basically what that means is that we can learn by watching others. And imitation is a very powerful way that babies learn. No surprise, right? Uh, mirror neurons are very cool, and I'm going to post a separate video about this because I think it's an amazing, um, you know, really amazing, amazing discovery that we um, didn't really find out that until fairly recently. So it's not it's not a long ago kind of discovery, but a more recent discovery. And basically what it is, is it's neurological evidence that observational learning really happens. What they found was that our neurons fire, whether it doesn't really matter whether we do the task ourselves or whether we're watching someone else do the task. So what happens is, is our neural pathways can be just as impacted, uh, you know, just by watching something. So now, of course, if we're watching something positive, that's great. But if we're watching something negative, that's not so good. So the impact is pretty significant on learning. 
Um, when we look at motor development, we're going to look at this throughout the year, uh, you know, the different developmental stages. Um, gross motor development has to do with all the large body muscles that we're using. So, you know, during the infant toddler years, our babies are learning to sit up, they're learning to stand, they're learning to walk, and then eventually learning to run. Those are all motor development skills. In terms of fine motor, those are smaller base skills. So you can see here the um, baby trying to pick up the Cheerios. You know, this is a very difficult task for a baby. Um, when they're, um, you know, just starting out. And then being able to get that Cheerio into their mouth is another big hurdle for them to accomplish. So um, you can tell if you ask a baby to draw a picture or something, they're not going to be able to do that yet. Their fine motor skills are not that advanced. So um, as we get into the preschool years and the earlier early childhood years, you'll see some of that shift a bit. Now, we talked about vision last chapter. I just want to men mention that the vision does get back on track by six months. So their baby's vision is just um, pretty much the same as grown-ups at this time. Um, they do have depth perception. You can see over here, this is the visual cliff experiment. And basically, this part here is just a clear glass um, you know, floor. But the checkerboard pattern that the baby sees here is down there. So they are perceiving it as a drop-off. So they won't go onto that, even though it clearly is a safe Place for them to be because they do perceive that it drops off. Um, babies also prefer patterns, um, you know, as their vision is developing. But um, the interesting thing that they discovered is that they're pretty good at telling whether that face is positive or negative. So babies have really come a long way in just a few months. So hopefully that gets you, um, you know, kind of oriented to some of the key concepts in this chapter. Clearly there's lots more, um, but at least it gets you a head start and provides you a little bit of background knowledge before you jump into the chapter. All right, take care. I'll see you soon.